Welcome back. I'm glad you're back for Mummies again. Uh, this will be our last lecture this time for, for, on mummies, I promise. But I want to tell you about my own research, a project I did a few years ago, and one that I think was important. Uh, remember we talked last time about how the mummies themselves give us clues about how mummification took place. Um, the reason I did this project, the reason I actually took a human cadaver and mummified it, was to learn the details of mummification. Let me tell you how it, how it sort of came about. I was writing a book on Egyptian mummies. And the usual party line among Egyptologists is, we know all about mummification. They took out the brain through the nose. They removed the internal organs. They dehydrated with natrin. We know all about it. But as I was writing the book, and I tried to give a really detailed description of mummification, I kind of did a, a mental mummification, I realized there were loads of details we had no idea about. There were, there were questions that had never been asked. For example, if you want to dehydrate the body, do you drain the blood first? Or, okay, you put the body in natrin. How much natrin? Or, when you look at mummies, there are little incisions, very small incisions in the abdomen. Right? The incision's only about two and a half inches long. Can you really get a liver, which is the largest organ in the human body, out of an incision that small? So there were plenty of specific questions that had never been asked that I really thought ought to be answered. And that's why I started the project. Now, let me emphasize something. We did the project, and I say we because I had plenty of help. We did the project not to get a mummy. We did the project to get knowledge. And it's knowledge about three specific areas. Let me mention the three areas. And as I explain to you the project, Keep those three areas in mind. You'll see it always, everything we did relates to one of those three areas. One was, we wanted to know just about everything about how the natron was used. How was that powder, that baking, powder, baking soda and, and salt used? We also wanted to know also about the surgical procedures. Exactly what were the surgical procedures? How do you remove a liver through an incision that small? How do you get a brain out through the nostril? And then we wanted to know about the tools of the embalmer. These people were professionals, but what were the tools that they used? Nobody had ever found tools labeled, you know, embalmer's knife, embalmer's this. We weren't sure what the tools were. So these three areas, surgical procedures, tools, natron, that's what we were looking for. Right? Now, in order to really learn how the ancients did it, we had to do it in the authentic way. We couldn't take any shortcuts, couldn't do anything different. And when I say we, Ron Wade, my co-researcher in this project, um, who is an anatomist, he's the director of the State Anatomy Board at Maryland, he was the one who worked with me, and we worked very closely together on this, and we felt that we had to do it just the way the ancient Egyptians did it. So, for example, for the natron, I went to the Wadi Natrun in Egypt, which is, Wadi means riverbed, it's a place outside of Cairo, about 60 miles out, where the ancient Egyp Egyptians gathered their natron. Remember that for the natron, Herodotus had said, he had used the word as if salting fish or preserving fish when he talked about how they used the natron. So we weren't sure if it was dry or wet, and we were interested in seeing if we could preserve a mummy in one way or the other. Um, our feeling was that it wasn't used in solution. Our feeling was that the natron was actually used as the powder, as it naturally occurs. And there are two reasons for this. One is, think about it. If the Egyptians really did mummify human cadavers in a solution of natron, there would have had to have been thousands of vats, large tubs in which these bodies were preserved. And we've never found such vats. So it's unlikely that they mummified all these bodies in solution. Also, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense if you're going to try to dehydrate a body to stick it in a liquid, not for the Egyptians, especially since their idea of mummification came from the bodies that were naturally mummified in the dry sand. So our feeling was they probably mummified in a dry natron, and that's how we were going to do it. So we got our natron just where the ancient Egyptians had gotten theirs. For our incense, frankincense and myrrh, I went to the spice bazaars in Cairo and bought it from the spice merchants. And they got it from exactly where the ancient Egyptians would have gotten it, from Yemen, from the Sudan. So we had our natron, we had our frankincense and myrrh. Now we needed our tools. 
Now, as I said, no one's ever found nicely labeled embalmer's tools uh, in any excavation. We looked at tools to see what would be the best, what would seem like the best bet for an embalmer's tool. There's even an article that had been written by a previous scholar about one tool which he said was almost certainly used for mummification. It's a knife which has a notch in the blade. Now the reason, and he even called it the necrotome, the death knife, right? The reason he thought it was used by embalmers is imagine if you're an embalmer. You're working in a slit that's only about two and a half inches in the, in the abdomen. You can only get one hand in probably. And how do you cut things easily with a knife? Well, if it has a notch, maybe you can kind of loop it around and then pull it, yank it, and that's how you cut something with the notch. We made a knife just like the ones that had been found with that notch. It was useless. <laughs> Didn't work at all for mummification. So we're quite sure he was wrong about the necrotome, the death knife. But we had to use other things also. So we made knives, replicas of knives that were found in excavations. Now we made them just like the Egyptian knives. Now the Egyptians had bronze knives. Bronze is made of tin and copper. And we made our knives just like the Egyptians. 88% copper, 12% tin. And we also discovered, by the way, that you can't cast a sharp bronze knife like that. It won't take a sharp edge. What you've got to do is beat it. So it had to be folded and beaten, folded and beaten into shape. And that's how we made our bronze knives. Um, bronze, by the way, must have been a little bit of a miracle for the Egyptians. The reason I say it is, what you do with bronze is you take two soft metals. Copper is soft and tin is soft. You put them together and you get a hard metal. How does that work? I mean, it must have been a little bit like a magic trick. It's because of the molecular structure, of course. The reason tin is soft and copper is soft is the molecules align and it slides. You can pull it. They literally slide. So when you combine them, you get a lattice work. It's much tougher. The Egyptians apparently knew how to do this, though. They could co combine these two. You know, that's why, by the way, we have the name chemistry today. Chemistry comes from the ancient Egyptian word for Egypt. Kemet. Kemet. It was KMT. Kemet. That was the, what the Egyptians called Egypt. And they were skilled at things like metalworking, making ceramics, the kinds of things we think about as being chemistry today. And the Arabs called it alchemy, the sort of skill of Egypt. And from alchemy, we got our chemistry. Right? So really, because the Egyptians could do things like this, we have the word chemistry. Now, we had to find someone who could do this kind of metalwork. And we found a silversmith a third generation silversmith who could beat our knives from copper and tin, making the bronze. So we had replicas of ancient Egyptian tools. Right? Also, if you remember, Herodotus said that the slitter makes the incision with a sharp Ethiopian stone, obsidian. We found somebody to flake obsidian for us. So we had obsidian blades also that we could use. And really, what was most useful, we had a simple flake, just a, a chunk of obsidian. Flaked off, nothing fancy, but we would use that too. Now, what about Herodotus saying a hooked iron rod was used to take out the brain? We found an instrument in an excavation, and we made a replica of it. It looks a little bit like a coat hanger with a kind of hook at the end, long, thin thing. Uh, we made ours out of bronze, because that's probably what they really used. But uh, we had ancient tools to work with. Now the question was, would it work? Could we do it? So we began. Now when we started to make the incision in the abdomen, we did it the same way Herodotus said, by the way. Made a nice little red line, marked where we were going to cut, and then I took a bronze knife. Didn't work. It was just too dull. It really didn't work. Most of us had thought that the reason Herodotus said a sharp Ethiopian stone was for ritual purposes, that maybe from the old days they used to use stones. But surely they had bronze knives. Why not use a, a real knife? The answer is the bronze knives don't cut that well. But then, when I took the sharp Ethiopian stone, the obsidian, the abdominal cavity opened up almost immediately. One gentle swipe through. I was down to the level of the adipose, the, 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 the fatty tissues, and then another one, and I was right into the abdominal cavity. It was as sharp as any surgeon's scalpel I had ever used. And I will tell you that today, 
Modern times, right now, surgeons are going back to using obsidian scalpels. They are better than surgical steel. They are sharper, thinner edge, and do less damage when you're making the incision. So the Egyptians knew what they were doing with their sharp Ethiopian stones. So we opened the abdominal cavity, and then we started removing internal organs. Now, another thing that was of interest to us was, in what order did the organs come out? Be interesting to know. So first one out was the spleen, right? We took out the spleen. Um, and then as we worked, we were taking out organs. The big question was the liver, of course. We really didn't know if it was going to come out of an incision two and a half inches long. The liver is the largest organ in the body. And a human liver is quite large. It, it fills up both, ha both hands. If you cup your hands together, the liver will more than fill up your two hands. So we didn't really know if it would come out. Um, we eventually got the liver out intact. Not easily, by the way. We had to make the incision a little bit longer, about another half inch, kind of like an episiotomy when somebody's giving birth. You just make the incision a little bit longer, and finally the liver came out. The liver is made up of two lobes. It's not a single chunk, so to speak. It's two lobes, and one comes out and the other slides behind it. So we did get the liver out. This also, by the way, answered a question I had wondered about in, in mummification. In the Metropolitan Museum of Art, in their exhibits, I had seen on display a liver from a mummification. But it wasn't really a whole liver, it was half a liver. And I sort of wondered why. And I think the answer is, sometimes they may have had to cut the liver in half. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the liver came out. We did figure out you could get a liver out of a small incision. Now, another interesting thing that we found was, you know, in going back through various medical papyri, we found the Egyptian words for the different parts of the body. But for example, for some internal organs, there is no word like pancreas. Now, why isn't there a word for pancreas? They supposedly knew anatomy or some anatomy. Well, the answer came to me sort of as, as a shock. I hadn't been thinking about this. With my colleague, Ron Wade, we were taking out internal organs. And we had taken out the intestines. You know, you have 22 feet of intestines in you. It's quite a bit. And we tied them off, and we take out the intestines. We take out the stomach. And as we're going along, I said to Ron, Ron, where's, where's the pancreas? And I sort of hadn't seen it. And Ron said, oh, it came out with the mesentery. It came out with the intestines. You don't see it. It's kind of a mess when it comes out. It's a, it's a mass. It just came out. And I think that's what happened with the Egyptians. They just didn't really notice it that much when it came out with everything else. Um, so anyway, we took out the internal organs. And then we wondered, why are there only four canopic jars? The four sons of Horus, that's nice. But you certainly have more than four internal organs. The canopic jars were supposedly for the stomach, liver, intestines, kidneys. What about other organs like the gallbladder, the pancreas, the spleen? Well, I think they just weren't important to the Egyptians. They may not have known the function. They may not have seen some of them. So I wonder what happened to them. You know, did they just get thrown out, perhaps? It could be. But we were learning by doing. It was a kind of experimental archaeology. Now, we had other questions. We, we, we proceeded right along on Egyptian ways. For example, after we had evacuated the abdominal cavity, we left the heart inside, just like the Egyptians did. Then we filled the empty, empty abdominal cavity with little packets of natron. We had seen mummies that had little packets of natron inside, and that was to absorb the moisture from the inside out. Right? That was filling the abdominal cavities. But I think the most surprising thing in these surgical procedures, trying to learn about the surgical procedures, perhaps the most surprising, was how the brain was removed. It didn't come out the way everybody thought. There had been some suggestions by Egyptologists, by physicians, about how the Egyptians removed the brain. Because we know it came out through the nose, because we have x-rays, we can see the nose has been a little damaged, the, there's a bone behind the nose, the ethmoid bone, which was broken. And here's how everybody thought the brain came out. Imagine the cadaver lying on its back. It's supine. Nose is towards the ceiling. And now you take your long coat hanger-like instrument, put it through the nasal passage. You break through the ethnoid bone, which is a little bone behind the eyes. It's thin. You can go through it. And now your little coat hanger-like instrument is inside the cranium, in the brain. And you pull it out, and it takes with it a little piece of brain. You keep repeating this process many times if necessary, pulling the brain out piece by piece. 
Everybody thought the brain came out that way. We tried it. It doesn't work. The brain is too, it's not viscous enough, it's not solid enough. Practically nothing adheres to that little coat hanger-like instrument when you pull the brain out. They couldn't have possibly gotten the brain out that way. So we did some talking, you know, how do you think, Ron, what do you think? And we finally figured out that what they must have done is put the coat hanger-like instrument into the brain and rotated it, using it almost like a whisk in a kitchen, breaking down the brain. Then they invert the cadaver so the brain runs out in its liquid state. And that's what we did. That's how we removed the brain, by breaking it down. And remember, the Egyptians didn't know you thought with your brain. They believed you thought with your heart, because it's your heart that gets excited and beats quickly, right? Not your brain. So we figured that's how they did it. Now the question is this. Once they've gotten the brain out, how do you know you've gotten it all out? You have to get it all out because you don't want the body to decay, and the brain will putrefy because it's moist, and bacteria will war work on anything that's moist. Well, we figured, I mean, we could have done an x-ray, but that would have been cheating. Certainly the Egyptians didn't do an x-ray. What we figured they must have done was taken linen, thin strips of linen, and we did this, and force it back into the cranium with that instrument. And when you pull out the linen, it's going to come out red with blood, some dura matter, some brain material will be on it. Well, put some more linen in. And we kept repeating that until the linen came out clean. Then we knew we had gotten all the brain out. So the surgical procedures were now pretty much complete. The brain had been removed. We learned how they did that. Abdominal work had been done. Learned how they did that. Now we had to dehydrate the body. Now, we tried to recreate what an Egyptian tomb might have been like in terms of temperature, humidity. We created a little tent. Now, one of Anubis, one of his names, right? Remember, Anubis is the jackal-headed god of embalming. One of Anubis's names is he who is in his tent. Because embalmers probably worked out of doors because of the smells. And another name for Anubis is he who was upon his hill. So Anubis worked high on a hill, in a tent, so the smells, the embalmers could work so the smells would go away. So we had set up a kind of tent, indoors, but a kind of tent, where we controlled temperature and humidity. We had the temperature at about 105 degrees, hot. We kept the humidity fairly low, around 22 or so, 23. And we put our cadaver, our eviscerated cadaver, in this room. And we covered the body with natron, dry natron. One of the things we learned was how much natron it takes for a human body. 600 pounds. That's a lot of natron. It took 600 pounds. Um, so we covered it in natron. We put it on a board, an embalmer's board. One embalmer's board had been found in an excavation and we made an exact duplicate of it, a wooden board. Interestingly, across the wooden board, it was a plank, was something that looked like railroad ties. Other boards the size of railroad ties, but spaced out about nine inches between them. We wondered why. And then when we put the mummy on the, our, our cadaver on the board, we figured out why. When your heart stops beating, the only thing determining fluids is gravity. It goes to the bottom. And naturally, you need most of your natron on the bottom of the body, because that's where the fluids are going to settle. So these railroad tie type things allowed you to keep a lot of natron under the body. You know, it filled in with natron, then you put the body on top of it, and then you pile natron on top of the body. So we put our body on this embalming board in our tent, so to speak, 105 degrees, 22, 23% humidity, and we left it there. Now the question is, how long to leave it? Well, we had a couple of different suggestions. One, remember, in the rind Papyrus, it said 35 days in the place of cleansing. But Herodotus said 70 days in natron, which was true. We figured we'd leave it for 35 days and see what happens. We think, and we're pretty sure we're right, Herodotus really was confused. It's 70 days for mourning. We knew that you had to put the body in the tomb after seven days. So we left it for 35 days in the natron, and we didn't look at it. I mean, we were pretty good. We were wondering what would happen, you know. We didn't know if it would work. You know, would we get a rotting cadaver? 
or would we have something like a mummy? And that was another interesting question we wanted to answer. You know, I'm sure you've never thought about it, but think about it now. When you go to a museum and you see a mummy, why does that mummy look like it does? Is it the result of the mummification process? Or is it because it's 3,000 years old now? Do you need 3,000 years to have something look like that? Or did it really look like a mummy as soon as it came out of the embalmer shop? Nobody knew, because nobody had ever seen a mummy coming right out of the embalmer shop. So that's basically one of the things we were going to learn. Our mummy was going to come right out of the embalmer shop. So we left it for 35 days. We thought we were going to be OK. I'll tell you why we thought we were going to be OK. With a human body, when it starts to decompose, when bacteria work on it, you can smell it. It's, it's, it's a very strong smell. And we were working inside a medical building, and people didn't smell it. So we thought it was working, but we weren't sure. After 35 days, we went in to look at our mummy. Now, when we started to remove the natron, we found that it was caked. It had almost become like cement. It was really caked. But we started to remove it, right? chipping it away a little bit, brushing some away. And the first thing that came, came out of the natron was the hand. We could see the hand. And it looked just like an ancient Egyptian's mummy's hand. So we now knew we had a mummy. And the reason a mummy looks as it does is because of not the 3,000 years, but the process itself. So we had our mummy, right? And it was looking very much like an ancient Egyptian mummy, very much. Interesting is the weight loss. The mummy had lost approximately half its weight in the 35 days. Now, part of it is the evisceration. We're taking out organs. We're taking out the brain. But most of that loss is water. Remember, you're mostly water. So if you're dehydrating, you're going to get a pretty light thing. So we had a little bit more than half its weight was gone now. We took out our mummy to examine it. Now, first thing we discovered, it wasn't bone dry. There was still some moisture in the body, mainly in the larger muscle groups at the bottom, like the gluteus maxima, the, the, your butt, also the thigh muscles, the quadriceps, was still moist. You could still feel a little bit of moisture. The hands, the feet, they were really dry like ancient, ancient mummies. But there was still some moisture. And we wondered, what should we do? Should we wrap our mummy, its final wrapping? Or should we put it back in natron? You know, what to do? We weren't sure. We decided we would learn more if we put it back in the tent, in its tomb-like setting, without any natron. Just as if, after 35 days, it had been, so to speak, wrapped and put it back in the tomb, will it decompose with no natron now? Or has enough moisture been taken out so that it will remain without decomposing? So we put it back in the tomb for a couple of months. We just left it there. And we came back. It was fine. Dehydrated much more, had lost more weight, was now down to about 45 pounds, and we had our mummy. Now it was time to wrap it. And we wanted to wrap it in a grand Egyptian style. As you now know, not all mummies are the same. We were doing a top-of-the-line mummy. We were doing a royal mummy. And we wanted to wrap it the same way royal mummies were wrapped in the 18th dynasty, with the hands crossed on the chest. And that's when we got our next surprise. And this may be even the most important thing we learned from this experiment. We couldn't cross the hands. The mummy now was so dry, it was brittle and inflexible, we couldn't cross the hands. Now, so we wound up wrapping it with its hands at its sides. But the point I want to make is this. The Egyptians, in their papyrus, said 35 days. There's a reason for the 35 days. After 35 days, our mummy still had a little flexibility. It had a little bit of moisture. We could have crossed the arms. We could have done whatever we wanted. That's why they say, leave it in the natron for 35 days. After 35 days, you can still manipulate the body and wrap it in any position you want. Then you can put it back in the tomb. It'll dehydrate, won't decay, and you're going to be OK. So we figured out pretty much almost exactly how the ancient Egyptians mummified. Their goal wasn't, as everybody had thought, get rid of every drop of moisture. Because moisture, of course, is the enemy of the body. This is why 
you know, you can have dry foods forever. You know, you get your, your cereal with a little bit of a little dried blueberry in the cereal. I mean, that's a mummy of a blueberry in a sense. It's dry. So there will be no bacteria working on it at all. So the Egyptians didn't try for complete dehydration. They wanted maximal dehydration so you could still have it flexible and wrap it, then put it in the tomb and you'll be okay. I mean, it's remarkable what they figured out. But our idea was to replicate it in the exact way the Egyptians did it so we could figure out. I mean, it was kind of really experimental archaeology. Now, remember in the beginning, I said that we were looking for information in three areas. One was how the natron was used, and we showed that you could really use dry natron, how much, how it was used. That worked fine. We wanted to learn about the surgical procedures. We did indeed figure out how you can remove the brain through the nose. Wasn't the way people thought. You can get the liver out through a small incision, about three inches for a large liver. And we even learned, we even learned about the tools. That, that sharp Ethiopian stone that Herodotus had mentioned was the best possible tool to use. It wasn't just because it was a ritual that had been done in ancient times. It was because this was the thing to use. It gave you a nice, clean cut, quick, opens up the abdo abdominal cavity. So we learned really quite a bit about the three things we wanted to learn about. But the experiment's not over. The mummy, in a sense, is an ongoing project. We hope it'll be used literally for centuries to come. We get requests around the world for samples of tissue, for x-rays of our mummy. And let me explain why. Our mummy is, in a sense, the only ancient Egyptian mummy, I say, but it's, of course, not ancient Egyptian, but it's just like an ancient Egyptian mummy. It's the only ancient Egyptian mummy for whom we know exactly what was done. We know everything done to our mummy, every procedure. We even put amulets inside, everything. And we, have, of course, have now x-rayed our mummies, CAT scanned it. We know exactly what our mummy looks like. Now, if somebody finds a mummy, an ancient mummy, and is wondering what was the procedure used on this mummy, in a sense, our mummy is the comparison one, the control. You can x-ray that mummy, compare it with our x-rays, and see, ah, different from this one. They didn't do that, or different from this. So, in a sense, our mummy is the standard against which real ancient Egyptian mummies can be checked. Also, we periodically check our mummy to see how is it holding up. It's now about, oh, it must be five years since we did this mummy project. And the mummy has been at room temperature, right? I mean, if we did it right, doesn't need refrigeration. Our mummy has been at room temperature for about five years. No signs of deterioration. It's even been on exhibit once in a museum. It traveled once. But we view it basically as a research tool. So we can now look at our mummy and say, this is what a mummy looked like after five years in a tomb. This is what a mummy looked like after 10 years in a tomb. This is what it looked like 20 years, and maybe for centuries on. We'll see what happened to a mummy as it was left in the tomb. But that's not all. For example, other uses of our mummy? DNA studies. You've all heard that DNA in mummies is, is a hot topic. That is, will we be able to use DNA in telling relationships? Can we tell, for example, if Tutankhamun is related to Akhenaten if we have the two mummies? Can we tell if this mummy suffered from this or what? DNA is an important study tool. And Paleopathologists, people who study disease in the ancient world, are very eager to use DNA in mummies. But let me emphasize, it hasn't been that successful. We haven't really been able to replicate ancient DNA very well. We haven't been able to work with it well. And we don't know why. One question is, perhaps it's the 3,000 years. Maybe after 3,000 years, DNA degrades. But another possibility is, perhaps it's because of the mummification process itself. Perhaps when you mummify, it destroys the DNA. Well, our mummy's the control again. Our mummy isn't 3,000 years old, but it has been mummified. We are now trying to work with our mummy's DNA. We have sent samples to laboratories around the world, and they are now trying to reconstruct the DNA of our mummy. If they're successful, then we will know that it's the 3,000 years that degrades the mummies in ancient Egyptians. If they're not successful, 
will know it's the mummification process. So it's an ongoing process. We're working with the mummy all the time. But the reason we did it was to figure out primarily how the Egyptians mummified surgical procedures, tools, and the use of nature. Next time, it's back to business as usual and ancient Egyptian history. See you then.